Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Uh, it is April. I, I Just occurring to me now that I probably should have had some sort of April Fool's joke planned, uh, but I have nothing uh, except that I am the April Fool because my co-host today is in Vegas. I am, of course, stuck in 50 degree weather here in Brooklyn. Uh, Jeremy Cohen, uh, I don't mind playing the fool, as but at least tell me that like you already told me no booze downstairs. Tell me you got something planned for this trip. Well, I've got something planned for after this trip. I'm gonna take the first vacation since I started my job okay. six months ago, so that'll be that's really something. nice. Gonna mosey on down to the Grand Canyon. That'll be a lot of fun. But for oh, this, so you, because be... you're already out there. Okay, exactly. that makes sense. There yeah. you go. And you know, it's it's nice because work already sent me out. Work has to send me back, so. Squeezing a little trip, and no, I'll probably do something fun while I'm here in Vegas. I just landed a few hours ago. Saw the Sphere for the first time. How was uh, it? You know, it was weird. It's actually a cube. A big huh? casino just wants you to think that it's a sphere. It's not. <laughs> it's just called the Sphere. It's really a cube. It's <laughs> fascinating how they do that. But that's where we're at. You know, this is my second time in the city. The first time was fine. It was May. It was a while ago. It was hot. Uh, and I'm excited to just record a pod with my two good friends and grab a drink by the pool and uh, see some women's college hoops tonight and go from there. That's sounds pretty good. I I, I haven't uh, I haven't I had I had I had one pool experience in Vegas my bachelor party, which was not a wild and crazy thing. Um, but it, it's, uh, there is something about being there and being in a pool and having a cocktail. It tastes a little bit better. I'll say that. So yeah. I'm going to step outside of the pool. I don't know what's really swimming in it, but I'll, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll enjoy my drink from the outside of it. You got a little cabana action going on. Maybe, you know, I Copa know. Cabana. <laughs> her name was Lola. She was a showgirl. <laughs> Actually, funny story. I oh my god, I'm going to embarrass myself because now I can't remember the guy's name. For my you have a Barry party, Manilow story, is that what you're going for right now? No, I don't have okay. a Barry Manilow story. Right. I have I the um. Oh, we're going to figure it out here live on the pod. Andrew might remember. For my bachelor party, we got a cabana at uh, I forget what the hell hotel we stayed in, but it had it was a Friday pool party during the day, and two cabanas over from us was a former Nick. And of course I'm forgetting the guy's name. He had played for Louisville. He was like a tall, like a, a, a forward. Um, he was a good college. He was like a tantalizing prospect. Never panned out in the pros though. And of course his name is escaping me right now. But Andrew, maybe by the end of the episode, you could figure out who the hell this guy was on it. <laughs> But yeah, so that's my that's my biggest story. I don't really have much else. Um, hopefully, you'll come back with a better one um, than that. Um, but for right now, I've been I've, I'm delaying it as long as I can. We should talk about this basketball team. Um, mm, 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 mm. Still not over the weekend, Jeremy. It's mo- what are we recording this on? It's Monday, six forty four p.m. Didn't get over the Friday game. Lost to the Spurs. Until the start of the OKC game. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Redemption time. And now it's almost 24 hours later and I'm still not over the Oklahoma City game. I This has not happened to me yet this year. Um, and I'm not in a good place. I'm just going to put it right out there. I'm not in a good place mentally. And I just, it's really unfortunate that they lost both of these games and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. So I'm going to need you to like, be the stabilizing force that you so often are. Uh, can you can you do that for me? Sorry, to, I'm sorry. What? No, I'm good. Thank you. So thank that's, you. That's how he's going to help you get there. That's it. Vegas, baby. Vegas <laughs> is someone knocking on your door to and ask you if you need alcohol in the middle. Seriously? That's what I was just. That's Did you say yes? I said I'm good for the moment. Thank you. I'll I'll go later. It's fine. But, Did you? Tell them that your friend isn't over the weekend, and I, well, that's the thing. It was the perfect time for them to come in and say, "Like, hey, would you like alcohol?" Because, like, yeah, let's talk about it. But what I, kind of alcohol? 
John, my focus is on you. It's on the, the listeners of oh, our podcast. Your, that, I can't wait for your call right now. I know, I, to, I know. It's fine. Get, I'll get through it sober. Get, get the then. person back and, and, and tell them to come knock on my door. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. It'll be like a nip for $48 and it'll be fine. Uh, yes. So, he, my I, I'm still not over this weekend. Okay. And the funny so thing about... Me. It's not just you. The funny thing about this week is if you were to zoom out, right? And you say, all right, this is a Knicks team that played four games. All four winnable games. The first two obliterated opponents. We're talking about one of the best offensive ratings that we've seen in years from that Raptors game. Like, doing exactly what was asked of them to do. Um, and the game before that, was it was Detroit, was it not? Yeah, it was against Detroit. Destroying them as well, winning by 25 points. And then you get to Friday. And teams sometimes just they're trap games. They went into San Antonio. San Antonio has been playing better for whatever it's worth. Their record is a little deceiving, but you go in there and I wasn't, I was following the game. I was at a concert and then I got to watch the very end of it. But as I was following it, it's like, you know, all right, this game's over 21 points, but yeah. now it's close it's one. And then it was a 12 point game from what I saw. And then it's back to one. It's just like you kept getting there. And it was the point of, at a certain, like at, later in the game, the Knicks didn't even manage to get the lead and overturn it. Yeah. It's like it was so close and they still weren't able to actually take the lead. And it was incredibly frustrating to spoil a 61 point performance because I was thinking Brunson has 58 points. He's got a chance at overtime. How cool is it going to be for him to score three points? Uh, or, or, or 59, I think he had 59 actually. And then he had, he had 59 and then he got, yeah, he got, it was a, he got a two, but I mean, he had a, mm-hmm. yeah, he took a couple shots that would have given yeah. the record, but, I mean. but, but like to go into that and thinking they're going to win in San Antonio is going to get the record. And then it's, he falls short of the record and they lose. And then it was just a, a salty feeling as well. When, when Banyama kicks the ball into the, or hurls the ball into the stands, you're like, all right, I mean, Annoying, but obviously they won. So like, like, and he got fined for it. Fine. Then go into Sunday's game. I felt very confident about Sunday's game for several reasons, but the main reason I felt so good about it leading into it was Mitchell Robinson because the thunder are such a poor rebounding team. I thought you get Mitch in there to dominate. It's done. Like that's, that's it. And yeah, he would, as you're holding up what I presume are snacks, he would have been snacking against them. He would have been feasting. He would have been gobbling up those boards. And he couldn't do that because Isaiah Hardenstein getting into foul trouble, leading the Mitchell Robinson playing in the San Antonio game, hurting his ankle, and then not playing against Oklahoma City. And then Knicks are up by what? 12 points and Mike Breen. Late third. Two, 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 in, two in chains left in the third quarter. When Mike Breen said in that moment of the Knicks record, as they were about to go oh. to the commercial break, I was like, you did it. You goofed it. Mike, it's it's done. It like and and it sure enough worked out exactly that way where they blew it. And that game made me even more mad. And I could I could look at it right and say this is one of the best teams in the West that the Knicks down OG Ananobi, down Julius Randle, down Mitchell Robinson, not even getting the calls that they should have in many ways gotten still managed to at the very last second or I guess 1.8 seconds, uh, <laughs> CSGA who had been so well defended by Deuce McBride, just use his height and do what a superstar does to win the game. And I still feel like crap about all of it, even though I can say this, you're looking at us at a week that could have been four and where this is still a team that's rocking and rolling that is on the right track. Of course, there are lingering questions about injuries, but this was a week that I, the first half felt incredible. Well, and then this week, I just feel after those last two games gutted. And I'm sure if you even them out, it's, it's somewhere probably close to like a scale of one to 10, one being, I feel terrible. 10 being, I feel great. Probably feel close to a four in the heat of the moment. But to your point, there haven't been that many games where I feel like, It's just gut-wrenching. And so for them to be back-to-back, it just makes it all the more excruciating. But 
it's they're they're so close. They're right there. That's oh. that's what's so irritating. Even if it was against against the best team in the West or one of or the worst team or one of the worst teams in the West, they had it and it just didn't come to fruition. I'll go a step further. Um, I don't think there has been another game that has come down to the final possession other than the Suns game with the Booker game winner, right? Mm -hmm. So we went 72 games and had one such instance of like, we got down to the wire and couldn't get over the finish line. And now it has happened twice in two games. So, you know, we are not conditioned for this. Uh, Last season, they had a lot of these sorts of games that went, sometimes went to Nick, it went the Knicks way. Sometimes it went not the Knicks way, but like that was kind of, that team played a lot of those games. This team has not. They have been in close games in the fourth quarter, but they have often, to their credit, to their credit, they're one of the best fourth quarter teams in the league. They've pulled away before it gets to the to the to the um, you know closing moments where it's going to be do or die. So there's that part of it. I'm happy you brought that up. Um, and I just want to say, well, I'm just like kind of stream of consciousness here, like. Again, logically, <laughs> logically, it should not be bad because you look at every team deserves is allowed, whatever you want to phrase it, to come out without their 100 percentile effort occasionally. This is an 82 freaking game season. These guys have been playing. You know, what? Here, I'm, I'm go all over the place. Josh Hart has averaged 40.8 minutes per game over the last his last 28 games. Insane. Do you want to take, what? It's insane. Do you want to take guess as, as as who the last player to average at least forty point eight minutes per game over a twenty eight game sample size is? I'll give you a clue. He played for the same coach as Josh Hart's playing for now. I mean, Jimmy Butler is one name that comes to mind. Jimmy Butler. It was ex- yeah. almost exactly a decade ago in the two thousand thirteen fourteen season. Averaged um, forty point. Uh, around close to 41 minutes a game for like a stretch of like around 30 games. That's the last time. And it's, it's Hart playing those minutes. It's McBride playing the minutes that he's playing. It's Brunson playing less minutes than those guys. But like, I haven't looked up his usage rate recently, but like he is, he is doing as much heavy lift lifting as any player in the NBA over the stretch without, you know, the support and, you know, and on, 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 Dante Vincenzo putting up, uh, you know, three pointers at a, a Steffian uh, rate, <laughs> you know, and like it's it, these guys are allowed to come out one night and be like, OK, we're playing a 16 win team. Maybe we don't have to fully accelerate on the gas. And sure enough, the, the night that they des- that not decide, but like the night that they do that, the Spurs are hitting everything from the floor. And it's like you blink and it's a 20 point lead. And then they went into halftime and they came out and after halftime, they outscored the Spurs by uh, I think 15 points in the second half, right? Because it was, they were down 15 at the half and then it went to overtime. So they did their job, right? 15 points a half. That's what you're supposed to do against a shitty team. You, you beat a shitty team by 30 points. They they kind of did that, but it was too little too late. And then to your point about the Thunder being a, a, um, a very good team, Jeremy, they're plus 7.3 points for 100 possessions this year. You probably know this, but I'll ask it anyway. You know how many teams were 7.3 points per 100 possessions better than the opposition last season in the NBA? Say one? Uh, that'd be zero. The league leading Boston Celtics were six point, I think it was like 6.5 or 6.6. So, and the year before that, um, the Suns led the league at plus 7.5. So, like this Thunder team, and again, they were like, yeah, SGA, a little hobbled, whatever. He played, you know, and they didn't have anybody else missing. So this Thunder team in 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 recent years would have been the best team in the league based on their statistical profile. And so like you love how the Knicks came out against that team and how they fought and how they and just everything. And so logically, we should not be sitting here, me and you, feeling as dejected as we are. And yet, that's that, I mean, that you know, that's baseball, Susan, right? Um, at least you have the Yankees, right? I do have the Yankees. Yes. And that was a nice weekend. A hundred percent. But no, it's, it's not, that's the thing. It's not the thunder. Like there's no shame in losing to Oklahoma city. It's not even having an off night against San Antonio is how 
both happened. Yeah. It was also it, if the games were called in a way that we felt well, that they should be called, it'd be a different story. And that's not excusing poor play, missed free throws, any other reasons you want to chalk up. I think the thing that perplexed me the most was seeing on social media people being upset about wanting culpability and accuracy from the referees as if that dictated the game, it plays a huge part. It's a major factor. It's not the only reason we can talk about no. several different reasons for why we are upset about things without it feeling like we're using it as a crutch. And it's not just Knicks fans. It's been NBA fans across the board who have been upset with how the game has been officiated. And perhaps at a certain point, if a lot of people are upset about it, maybe there's merit to it. But I digress. I, I think the... Like one more thing is just like sixty-one points and six free throws attempted. I mean, that, I understand. I understand that Victor Wembanyama is so elite at this age, just even in general, that the Knicks didn't want to go close to the rim in a lot of ways. But I don't know if that's impressive on a how is it only six free throw attempts or how is it only six free throw attempts. Like, there are two different ways well, of being astounded by that statistic. One is just pure shock in a positive way, and the other is just completely mystified. No, it's, it is mystifying, and I went and looked it up immediately after the game. There's been, I don't know, 80-something 60-point um, uh, games in the history of the NBA. This was the third in which the player did not take at least double-digit free throw attempts. And the other two, one was the the other, the most recent 60 point game before this, which was Steph Curry. And he put up 23 threes in the game. So like very different sort of way of going about like his, his shooting. You're not going to get that many free throw attempts if you put up that many shots from three. And then the other was Rick Barry in the fucking seventies. And, um, <laughs> Rick Barry from everything I've read was a notorious asshole and everybody hated him. <laughs> and apparently the refs, <laughs> the refs hated him too because they didn't call any fouls. But but I digress. No, it was it was ridiculous. And like, yeah, the NBA came out with the last two minutes report and said that the last play in the Thunder game wasn't a foul, which like that almost makes it worse because I, and I look, I'm not we're not getting into the whole thing about the refs right now and, and how the NBA no, changes officiating, but we can. I mean if we I, if we But like we we so they they it clearly they clearly felt there was a problem. The, the NBA, they felt there was a problem and they're like, we need to put the put the genie back in the bottle. And I appreciate that effort because I do think in the long run, it is better for the game. But if you have gotten to a point where that is not a foul, where the where the I mean, that was not I call it incidental contact if you want. Like he got thrown to the ground. Like I know it was like kind of after the the shot w was gone, but like it like I I don't that there we should not be living in a world where that is not a foul. So there needs to be some uh, some equilibrium here between what we where we were and now where we have arrived at, where we could at least call the game fairly, you know. And and let, let just the last thing, and that's the only thing, other thing I want to say about it. I do think he is Brunson is disadvantaged by the fact that he is so small. And like, you know, Wendy had, you know, spoke about this on his pod, the hoop collective earlier today about how like Brunson is like a foul hunter, but then they, you know, someone clarified, I figured it was him or someone else on the pod clarified. It's like, well, he's not hunting fouls in the same way as Trey Young and like James Harden used to hunt fouls. Mm -hmm. And it, there, it, there are fine lines, like the shit that Young and Harden used to do. That's why the rules have changed. That's what we need to litigate out of the game because that's not basketball. But like, there's a di there, there. It may be a minute or, or or like slight difference, but there is a difference between that stuff and how Jalen Brunson goes about his business. And I think he is getting grouped in with the those guys where the 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 refs are like, yeah, sorry, little guys, we're not letting you get off easy anymore. You're gonna have to play the same way as the big boys play. And it's, I don't know, that rubs me. Um, the wrong way, and I don't think it's just because I'm obviously a Nick fan who's, who's rooting for Jalen Brunson. I legitimately don't know what a foul is anymore. I, how could you? Like when it comes to Jalen Brunson, I have no clue because from the very first game until the most recent game, there have been instances where I'm just perplexed, right? The very first game, Tatum lands in Brunson's spot yeah. on that three. No call. On the other end, the Knicks get called for it. 
Okay. Um, then you see Houston and that whole Brunson fouls holiday on a circus shot. And that's a foul. Okay. Yeah. And then you have Lou Dort stepping into his circle again, like again, yeah. not Lou Dort, but like someone else doing this and they yeah. rule there was no malice there. It just, it, it was incidental, but even if it's incidental, it can still be a, a, a upgraded as a foul. Yeah. And then he lodges his body into Brunson and Brunson gets knocked around like a rag doll and there's still no call. And I just don't know what a foul is when it comes to Jalen Brunson. Well, ne- neither do the refs. Um, and that's a problem that the NBA is going to, I hope work to address um, in the off season, but that's not really any help to us right now. Um, let's talk about the other major matter at hand before we get to the playoff picture. Um, we got, I don't even know if I should call them injury updates today. Uh, well, let's just go through some of the stuff that has been said or tweeted or whatever in the last couple hours. So, Injury report for Miami. Uh, Mitch is questionable. Uh, OG Ananobi and Julius Randle still out. OG Ananobi's designation in terms of his injury status or his the injury they are attributing to him has changed from basically managing. You know, I forget what nonsense they used to say, but now they have gone and 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 kind of I guess told the truth, which is he has elbow tendinopathy which is an actual injury, which is something that they have been avoiding saying for the better part of three weeks. So there's that. We had Shams come on uh, his show and say that expect OG back before Julius and that um, the hope is that it is not um, if, but when OG Ananobi comes back and kind of left it mysterious on Randall. And then we had Woj going on TV and saying, the Knicks, the whole thing with the Knicks keeping Ananobi out is they are, 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 they want this issue to go away completely. They no longer want this to linger. Um, they're going to keep him out. You know, the, the, their eye is on the prize. Their eye is on the playoffs. And they want to make sure he's right for the playoffs. It doesn't mean he won't come back by the end of the regular season. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but they are, have the, their eye on the, on the bigger picture here. Um, and, with regards to Randall, he just pointed out the same thing that everybody's been pointing out, which is that there has been no change in his status, no change in what he's doing. He's taking control of contact, and that is that. I will go right to the most interesting thing to me, and then we could dance around. We've talked about it on this pod many times. Woj is uh, is CAA uh, mouthpiece. Uh, one might one might proffer, and I found it interesting that. As the uh, scuttlebutt, not scuttlebutt, that's the wrong word. As the, as the volume has increased on people questioning OG Ananobi's toughness and willingness to play with discomfort, and Josh Hart, uh, it's perhaps not coincidentally, speaking in front of his locker room after the game against the Thunder, and perhaps ever so slightly uh, having a tone of like uh, annoyance about what the current situation is with these guys. You, you go watch the clip, you read into it, you know, and, and you could only read so much from a video like we weren't in the room. But like, I found it interesting that Woj comes out and is basically like the team, not Joe Jadonobi, the team does not want to fuck around here. Um, now, CAA may run the Knicks, but they also represent OG Ananobi. So this is like the tangled webs we weave. I, I just I, I found the the difference in in kind of verbiage there uh, interesting. And that I'll, I'll just start there and then I'll, I'll toss it to you. Yeah, you know, there was something that was oddly comforting that there's at least an update in the medical uh, sure. <laughs> world that they're they're at least talking about it online. Because I think the thing that bothers me the most is just no answer. It's it's indefinite. It, well, when does indefinite become definite? Yeah. And we're just still waiting. Because I would rather be told no than. <laughs> wait for a yes, a maybe, or a no. Yeah. It's just in life. So yeah. to see it play out in the NBA form from my basketball team, it's incredibly frustrating when the Knicks clearly need at least one of them just to start to come back. So, but you know, you, you mentioned um, the whole f- thought process of like OG and not being healthy and all of that. My question is, and this is not directed at you, this is just in general. Why is it that for Randall, it's, oh, well, he's hurt. So he's taking time 
And for OG, it's, well, is he tough enough to play? Yeah. Why isn't he able to do it? Like, I'm sure these guys want to play basketball. OG came back when he was cleared and he was able to play. We saw him scream in pain and <laughs> then he continued to play throughout the game. And he couldn't shoot the fucking basketball, Jeremy. Don't no. forget that part. Right. So perhaps just a thought, this isn't OG saying in a contract year, I yeah. want to play it safe. And maybe, just maybe, this is the Knicks saying we have our eyes on a larger prize. Yep. We don't want to risk any sort of injury. If it's still bothering you, OG, maybe you could play, but we don't want you to play. We've all had situations where we want to do something and our bosses have told us no. So this is less of a defense for OG and more of a perhaps there's more to this than simply saying it's a question of his mettle or his toughness. Because I'm sure he would love nothing more than to be playing. That's exactly what the case with Randall would be. Fred talked about how tough of a player Randall is, how motivated he is to get back out there. And he seems further behind in the process than OG. So, but we're not saying, well, Randall's not tough enough. We're saying, well, the Knicks are holding him out because, yeah. you know, they're waiting for the right situation. So just context that I think is needed for all of us as we evaluate a situation where we don't have a lot of the pieces. It's a great call by you uh, um, to, to, to note that specifically. We are heartbroken over these two losses. The Knicks in the locker room that played in the games and gave, them, gave everything of themselves. The three guys who played 40 plus minutes, you know, they are truly heartbroken. Not heartbroken, I mean, it's a strong word, but like they, you know, Josh Hart said it's incredibly frustrating. And he was being, being kind about those words. At the end of the day, what we are talking about here with these losses and whether they go, how many games are left? Eight games. Whether they go four and four or five and three or six and two or whatever it is, is the difference between a second round date with Boston potentially, or if they were to get fortunate enough to win a round and then whether they face Milwaukee, maybe they face Philly, who the hell knows, but like potentially avoiding Boston until the Eastern Conference finals. You know, at worst, I mean, I, I again, the, like the, the the odds of them actually falling this far are very, very slim. But like at worst, we're talking like, OK, maybe they fall to six and then but like, OK, it's it's a it's a first round on the road. Maybe you're going to have that anyway. in the five, like we're talking about semantics here that like. For one, if this team is good enough, it's not going to matter whether they play the Cavs or the Pacers or the Magic or the whoever in the first round. That's one. More importantly, it's really not going to fucking matter who they play if they don't have these guys back when they play those teams. And if they play the Celtics in the second round or the third round, if they're even fortunate enough to get there, the only chance, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough, the only chance in hell that they will have of giving that team, for as, as flawed as they may be, the only chance they have of giving that team a fight is if they are whole. And if they are not whole, then we could all go home and then none of this fucking matters. And that is only this season. And we're not even talking about the real prize that this team has its eye on, as I believe, and I'm pretty sure you still believe too, which is next year and beyond. When the window, when the, right now the window is this, maybe this much open, when it goes, okay, let's lift it all the way up and let's see what we can really do here. So... For all those reasons, I, I I I respect and understand everything that's going on, but at the same time, I also respect and understand everybody's frustrations with the current situation. And again, that includes the players who are, I'm sure are frustrated. Like, isn't that kind of where we're at at this point? It should be. And uh, there's one more point, and I understand why you wouldn't make it because why would you assume this to be the case? But if the say like the Celtics in this particular example, if one of their key players gets hurt. Then and like then it's a different story because we're looking at them as if they're whole and the Knicks aren't. But I get why you wouldn't evaluate that sort of what if if they're all healthy. Yeah, I, you know the the thing about Josh Hart was his comments. I mean, his exact comments were, "I'm looking at it like this is the team we're going to have." And then he said, I'm not in those medical conversations or anything like that. So I don't know shit from shit, but we've got to approach every game and the end of the season that those it. guys aren't coming back. And if they do be pleasantly surprised. And I think that is a very appropriate quote. It's we're facing like, it's just whoever is playing and we lock in and that's the group. 
But of course, for example, ESPN's headline, Josh Hart, pleasantly surprised if OG and Anobi Julius Randle return. And when it gets simplified, then it builds. And then there's a belief of, well, they're never coming back yeah. because you heard it. Josh Hart himself said, yeah. I don't expect the back. It was like, well, it's not that he's saying that they're done for the season. It's he's, as you said, playing 40, 20 minutes per game over what? 28, 28 20 games. games. Right. Yeah. Like that's, if I were him, I'd be like, help's not on the way. The cavalry is not coming. I'll see it when I believe it, yeah. but also not necessarily being of the mindset of, well, it's never going to happen and we're screwed. So I like I, but I agree with you in that this team, it, they need to be whole. This is a um, saying the season is a nice surprise completely undersells how good this team is. Yeah, but no, I, I, and, and, yeah. and you're not making that point. I want to yeah. be abundantly clear about that. It's more me trying to formulate it because I'm with you in that this isn't the ideal version of that team that they view as the contender. And I, I wouldn't even say this is a pretender. This is like this weird liminal space team that's yeah, like in between they're, yeah. right it, it, they're like they're neither pretender they're nor are they contender but you catch them with the right matchups in a seven game series especially if they're healthy i love their odds even if they're not the favorites i love the chance so it's it's tough for me though because i'm fully back in like i'm completely all in in a, in a season where i'm just a really busy person and it's been fun to watch the team and they make these trades and you feel better about it. And they start excelling in January and you're just completely all in. So to then have that incredible month and you're like, well, are we going to yeah. recapture that? And it's not even because it felt like it was fluky. It's just health. Like uh, 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 Hawkins junior slide is the reason we don't have Julius Randle. Like OG and Obi's elbow flaring up is a reason why this already good defense isn't an elite defense. Yeah. So it, what can you do? Right. But, but yeah, it's, it's not a defeatist attitude that I want to put out there. It's an understanding of give them hell, see how far you go. But to me, it's not like got to get to this point or bust because there's no fun in that. And also it just would be setting what I think are unrealistic expectations. Last thing I want to say on this, and let's move on. It's not, if you want to say that we're being defeatist, that's fine. You're right. But the, the, the distinction that I am attempting to draw, and maybe I'm not doing a very good job of it, is between a team like the Knicks, where the oldest play, the oldest core player on the roster is still under 30 years old. What if Randall turned 29, I think? Mm -hmm. um, so still under 30 years old. As we've said, ad nauseum, all their picks, they got, they keep, they keep getting bargains. McBride, DiVincenzo, Brunson's still on a on a bargain contract. Like they are so well set up. Whereas you look at, I mean, pick a fucking team, Phoenix or the Clippers, or I mean, even like I know Anthony Edwards is whatever age he is, but like with the everything going on with the Minnesota's ownership situation and that impending bill that's going to be due and the changes that they're going to have to make this summer, not next summer, not summer after that, this summer. You know, uh, you know, the I mean, the pressure on Boston. Like if not now, when when for Milwaukee. the Celtics? Like I, I, you took the words out of my mouth. The, the the Bucks, even like a team like the Heath, like Jimmy Butler, he get any any younger, or neither for that matter is Pat Riley. So like you could look at all these different situations around the league and be like, man, you might not. It's not getting any better than it is right now. That is not the case for the Knicks. Like I, f that's my belief. That's my opinion. I don't think like as as I've seen some people say like oh. Well, we got to capitalize because you know, Jalen Brunson's at the peak of his powers. Guess what? I think Jalen Brunson is going to keep getting it even better. You know, like that's again, that's just my two cents. But like, I think we're in for a run of a few years here with him. Nothing's guaranteed, but um, so that's that's where I'm coming from. Um, I just wanted to put that out there because I understand people probably might hear this and be like, well, you know, this is nonsense. Um, okay. Uh, playoff picture. Let's let's run through this. Um, although I think we can start narrowing this down a little bit. So our playoff picture is now presented by T Squared Social, where we just had our uh, successful watch party watching the Nets game. We've been uh, touting them on all the post games. Uh, come watch the Knicks or any out of market NBA game because they have League Pass, so that's great. Uh, that affects the Knicks playoff chances. You could join one of their Friday night leagues, whether it's darts, bowling, golf, or cornhole. Yes, cornhole. Uh, use promo code KFS10 
for 10% off when you sign up for one of those leagues. If I was in my 20s, I would sign up for a darts league yesterday. Um, I'm not very good at darts, but I think darts are so much fun. Um, the deadline for that, by the way, is uh, April 3rd. So you got to do it in the next few days. Go to T squared social.com slash leagues. Again, T squared social.com slash leagues. Again, KFS 10 is the code you're going to use for 10% off when you sign up. Um, okay. Playoff picture. It's on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible for folks listening at home. Um, I am making the executive decision. Andrew Claudio, I'm sorry. I know you're putting a lot of effort into this. I'm not even reading Milwaukee's upcoming schedule. You could yell at me after. You could yell, you come on, yell at me right now. I don't even care. Yell at me in front of the in front of the viewers at home and the listeners. Because guess what? To see it ain't happening. So bye-bye, Milwaukee. It was it was fun chasing you out last it. Cleveland in the three spot. They're 45 and 30, a half game up on the Knicks. Um, they have one less game, which is notable. They are finishing up a four game uh, or what's left of a five game road trip at Utah, which I imagine will be a win. And then three very dicey games at Phoenix, at the Lakers, at the Clippers. And then they come home for what should be a, a win against Memphis. Um, the Knicks, we know what's up with the Knicks. Four out of their next five on the road. So at Miami, home for Sacramento. Sacramento's. Going through it a little bit right now. They uh, lost uh, your cousin, uh, the Red Rifle, uh, Kevin Herter, for the season. And uh, also Malik Monk, uh, even a more significant injury for them. He's going to be out unless they advance in the playoffs, probably for the rest of the year. Um, so that's a big game. And then at Chicago, at Milwaukee, at Chicago. Those are the next three. Um, number five seed, Orlando, currently a uh, Game back of the Knicks, I believe. Their next five at New Orleans, at Charlotte, mm. home for Chicago, at Houston, who finally lost, and then at Milwaukee. So some dicey games in there. Number six seed, uh, Milwaukee. They have a home and home with Brooklyn, um, followed by Oklahoma City, Miami. Those are at home. And then at Toronto and then at Cleveland. So tough slate coming up for the Pacers. That game with the Heat obviously looms large. And then um, very briefly, Miami, Knicks, Sixers at Rockets, at uh, Pacers, at Hawks. And then Philadelphia, 76ers, with potentially Joel Embiid making his debut um, to, tonight as you were listening to this against the Oklahoma City Thunder. And they'll follow that game up with game at Miami. At Memphis, at the Spurs, and then Detroit. So that's where we're at. Um, Jeremy, what's one takeaway you have from the playoff picture as it stands right now? My one takeaway. Or your one one thought, your biggest concern, your biggest what, like anything you're like, this is the thing that I, my attention is focused on, you know, over the next week like are you worried about falling a six are you gung-ho for three still like where are you at this is sort of nicks related but at the same time i guess not it's uh because it will it if the knicks manage to go into the second round this is a possibility in some way uh what happens to miami and philly as okay. as it continues just because you know is philly going to play boston is miami going to play boston how do miami and Milwaukee matchup or the Knicks actually in a better position if they finish three through six, like are they in good shape? And I think that they'll be fine no matter what I'd say Orlando. I think that they're going to stumble a bit. Those are some tough games. Um, New Orleans, Houston, Milwaukee on the road for all of them. It's going to be tricky. I mean, maybe they're able to pull it off, but I I like the Knicks odds of staying top four and given Cleveland. I mean, those comments that came from Donovan Mitchell after the Nuggets game. Uh, I don't <laughs> yeah, know if that will uh, light a fire under Cleveland or we should say way what they on are. them. He was basically yeah, I mean, just like, it's what does he say? It's fucking April. Like, what are we doing here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which sounds exactly like the words that, you know, would come out of your star player who is absolutely resigning it's according to Dan Gilbert. But I would just, uh, I feel pretty good about their chances in the top four, specifically third or fourth, but just got to take care of business. That's 
easy. I mean, obvious, but it's just where they're at. Um, here's where I'm at. And I don't even know if this is fully dictated by logic. I just don't want to fall to six. I don't want to fall to six. If I had my druthers, like I'd rather three or four than five. But like, do I think the Knicks, if they're in a four or five matchup on the road against Orlando, they will win that series? Yes, I do. Do I think it'll be in probably a slightly easier? Well, I was going to say, do I think it'll be a slightly easier series if they have home court advantage? I was going to say yes. And then I'm like, all the pressure in the world on the magic to with the, if they have home court advantage, meanwhile, the Knicks coming in with playoff experience, like it's going to be a quasi home crowd for the Knicks. Um, I almost wonder if like being the road team in that series might, uh, may might be an advantage, but like, so like, yeah, so there it is. I don't want to fall to six, be in the four or five, end up playing Boston in the second round, or I guess potentially Philly. If the Sixers just come in and upset the Celtics, that would be something. Um, you know, whatever, have at it. And then if, but if the Knicks could still get to three, that's fine too. You know, it would be, it would be quite an achievement for this team to, to, to pull that off. And, um, we'll see where we end up. Um, I can't, but, I can't be that worried about six though, because it's just matching because in a scenario with the Cavs. And I feel okay about that just based on how the Knicks have played the Cavs over the last 18 months. It's not causing me to lose much sleep. I keep there is a nagging part of me that's like where the Cavs are concerned specifically. Just like be careful what you wish for. I'm not saying it's dictated by logic, so it's I don't even, you don't have to say anything. It's just like what I'm saying is not logical. It's just that sneaking. But then I it's like is Donovan right? If because if Donovan's right, if not if Donovan's not right, then it's like. And who knows? Maybe that team is just broken. Maybe they know he's leaving. Maybe he knows he's. Le- I don't know. We don't know. Um, I think the biggest argument against not wanting him to fall or not wanting the Knicks to fall to six is that if they match up with the Cavs and the Knicks beat the Cavs and then you go into the off season and he says he doesn't want to be there. And now you're saying to Cleveland, hey, remember how we beat you two years in a row in the playoffs, send you home? Why don't you also consider sending us Donovan Mitchell? I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, we'll talk about that in the future. We'll, t- we'll talk right. about it in the future. All right. Let's give out some game balls, detention predictions and get the hell out of here. Um, as you know, our game ball is given to a player, coach or entity that has stood out this week and deserves special recognition. Um, as, as usual, I'm just reading the words that are on the page that Andrew Claudio has written. Pick a Knicks starter. Jalen Brunson, 61 points for San Antonio. How you doing? He didn't write that. I added that. Dante DiVincenzo, 11 threes versus the Pistons. Deuce McBride, nine threes, nine, nine times he made it from behind the arc against the Raptors. Josh Hart had a triple-double versus Detroit, 897 more minutes this week. Um, he's actually trailing McBride in minutes for the team by a, a, a not slight margin in the last seven games. McBride in the last seven games is playing 44 minutes a night, which is like, very, very funny. Um, Isaiah Hardenstein, 19th in EPM, second in defensive EPM. He is fucking awesome. And then Juan Soto, I believe, plays for the Yankees, but like the Mets fans are have a hard on for him. Is that a thing? Um, a Jokic level impact weekend in Houston. Did I miss anything? No, uh, just that Jalen Brunson is eighth in EPM right now. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, it's just again wild to look at EPM and not have to scroll down to see a Nick. Like, yeah. can you imagine that? That's crazy. No. Look at us. Who's, <laughs> who would have thought it? Um, I'm I'm going to give it to Jalen Brunson. Uh, so, like, I what? There's nothing left to say about this player. Um, to score 61 points in an NBA game, it really it hit me <clears throat> the night after I got done with the post game and I searched up all the players who had scored 60 points to kind of see, you know, the, the, the list of names in full. And is it something that has happened a lot more uh, recently in the NBA than it used to? Absolutely. If you take out the Wilt Chamberlain games, which <laughs> account for like a third of, all the 60 point games in NBA history. If you take them out uh, about half of the 60 point games that have ever happened in the NBA have happened in the last decade, like scoring's up, like it's an offense first league. I get it. Even so 
you look at the names of the guys that have done this, there are no there are no imposters, I think is the way I put it in the newsletter. Like, even if you want to tell me, like, yeah, Gilbert Arenas, like Bradley Beal, like Bradley Beal led the NBA in scoring, you know? Um, Gilbert Arenas, like before he got hurt, was like a dude, you know, an all NBA caliber, like best player on a team that got home court advantage, I think, in the first round once. Like, and those are the worst players on the list. Most of the list is like top 75ers, you know, first battle hall of famers. Like that's those are the players that do this. And um, and now Jalen Brunson's one of them. It's a sign of where he is. It's a sign of where he's going. And it's just so amazing to have this guy on our team. And um, and the, just the last thing I'll say about it is like, you know, like you said, they were down by 21. Like other teams in the league, and I understand the Knicks are not other teams, but like other teams in the league just like, they go quietly into the night in those games. And Jalen Brunson was like, fuck that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win the game for us by myself. And he almost did. And that was really cool to see. And I'm never going to forget it. So uh, Jalen Brunson gets my game ball. I think he's the obvious candidate. It's funny. A lot of times I think about just from a future standpoint of obviously what players maximize Brunson. But the prevailing thought for me was often, well, who can you get who's better than... Jalen Brunson to really make this <laughs> yeah. team a contender. And now I'm at the point where it's like, right. does, does, that, uh, does that really matter? Because maybe it doesn't. Maybe he is truly that good where we don't have to have that conversation. And it could just be add the best talent you see fit. Uh, he's fantastic. Side note, Mark Berman, I should say Mark Berman MD tweeted, this is not bad news about OG Ananobi's uh, tennis elbow injury. Uh, he, Mark Berman had it three months ago, kept playing with an elbow sleeve, and it just went away 10 days later. But complete rest is best option of erasing pain. So you heard the, it from Mark. If he survived it, OG can survive it. It's fine. All I can think about, I, and I, was, I read the tweet when it came in, all I can think about is, I want to see Berman on a tennis court. That's all I want to see. Yeah. I, I bet you go to Florida and he's just the most ferocious pickleball player you've ever seen. <laughs> like I bet he runs up to the net and just smashes it right in your face. And I'm sure I'm sure he's great. I will text Berman uh, next time I'm in Florida and I will ask him if, if he is up for a round of tennis and I will see if he will indulge me in that and uh, we'll videotape it. We'll make it a whole thing for KFS. You know okay. what? I'm going to Miami soon for work. Connect me. Let's do it. I'm honestly pickleball or tennis. Let's do, let's do doubles. Let's get it. Uh, my pick for this week is going to go to Juan Soto. Uh, yeah, I know. This is a, a basketball <laughs> podcast. I don't really care uh, because Juan Soto went nine for 17 with a home run, four RBIs, uh, and an insane OPS of 1365. He was, he's just a joy to watch. To your point, yes, Mets fans are very eager to see him in Queens next year. And I mean, you can make the trip out there when the Yankees come by. It'll be fine. You'll have a nice time. You'll enjoy all the delicious foods that City Field has to offer and watch Juan Soto play for the Yankees. So in the meantime, <laughs> he, well, uh, I didn't even criticize the Mets for their weekend. I just said he's ours. So back off. But that's okay because he was fantastic. And in a weekend with nothing but Nick's atrocities from a record standpoint. Obviously, yeah, Jalen Brunson being Jalen Brunson, different story. But like okay. when you have two of the most gut-wrenching losses of the season back-to-back, to have a four-game sweep where you clinch the season series uh, and the tiebreaker, if necessary, against the Astros, who have just haunted Yankees fans' dreams for years, that's it's got to be Juan Soto. I, they got him in a trade from the Padres? Mm-hmm. I knew that. I'm so proud of myself. Um, it's a wonderful pick. Uh, detention. Uh, we are giving it to a player, coach, or entity that deserves to sit down for a while and think about what they have done wrong, starting with, and again, these are Andrew Claudio's words, not mine. Any haters that ridiculed me, John, for correctly predicting two and two, they should be ashamed of themselves for such behavior. Thankfully, GMAC always believed in John and this prediction, 100%. <clears throat> pick a piston. Boyan Bogdanovich, bruh. Alec Burks, bruh, bruh, 
NBA officials, uh, Siri play three blind mice. And of course, because uh, it is the Jaime Hawkes Jr. Memorial Detention Room, uh, Jaime Hawkes Jr. Uh, I am going to give it. Oh, hang on. What? I, it's my turn this time. Oh, shoot. I, That's right. I'm sorry. You've won enough times. I would have thought you'd know by now. You know, I, I yeah, picked first for great. detention. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know why? Because I'm so excited to read a stat. And I hope you. If Well, actually, I'll be able to read the stat regardless of who you pick. So just do what you got to do. Sure. Well, the first thing I'll say is uh, if I had to do it all over again, I'd still pick three and one. Uh, you you won the week. Congratulations. But considering how razor thin the margins of those two losses were, I, I think I feel pretty good about the selection that I made. But kudos to you for going with the win for this one. I mean, I just feel like I'm ping ponging between Bogdanovich and Burks every single time. I'm going to go with uh, Alec Burks on this one. But the... The main thought that I have here is, and this is very evident, like we could talk about who the Knicks get in the future and and all that, like what the next big window open move is. And I just, uh, I look at how atrocious this team is with Jalen Brunson off the floor. And so much of that rests on Alec Burks' shoulders. And I just continue thinking, man, if you had someone who you trusted, to run the ball in the limited time that Jalen Brunson is off the floor, how much better would we be feeling? Like, would that two and two record be four and oh? Because I think there's a very good argument that it could be. Uh, even if it, and that's not sour grapes about our predictions, it's just no, it, it, how many games have the Knicks sacrificed because they just didn't have that player? And it's Alec Burks just isn't cutting it. And I know that's not a bold statement, that's very obvious, but. Just it's almost like, man, the you're not gonna find a solution. You have to hope he gets magically better. I don't necessarily see it. So how long mm-hmm. are you running Brunson out there in the playoffs? How does that impact his game? I thought that, and maybe maybe you had a different viewpoint on this, John, but I thought a major reason why he didn't get to 62 or even higher, he was exhausted. He was tired. Yes. He worked so good. hard to get those points. They did not come easy on Sunday. Once again, fatigued, all the missed free throws, the uncharacteristic, the missed shots. It's just having someone to hold down the fort in those moments is showing why it's one of the most important focal points for this summer. And Alec Burks is right now the person who is responsible for patching those minutes up, and he's just not getting the job done. So uh, you went with Burks, I'll go with Bogdanovich um, because I. Again, one of, I co-sign everything you said. Uh, here's a stat for you. You you cited the numbers with Brunson on the court versus Brunson off the court as of I forget if it was just before the Thunder game. I looked at it or after the Thunder game. I'm pretty sure it was before the Thunder game. So the but the, the numbers have gotten more severe. I think there's a 23 points per hundred possession difference between when he's on versus when he's off since the Randall and OG Ananobi injury. Uh, so I think they're plus about plus 11 with him on and minus 12 with him off. Um, here's another one for you. The current starting five of Isaiah Hardenstein, Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, Jalen Brunson, and Deucey Pride. I played 11 games together. Um, I'm not sure if all of those games have been in the last whatever it is, month or two, but they have pl- they've appeared together in 11 games. They've played 136 minutes over those 11 games. One of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Nick lineups to play at least 100 minutes together, which is kind of a lot. Um, and it, it speaks to how all over the place they've been this year. Um, that starting five, Jeremy, is outscoring teams by 35.6 points per 100 possessions. <laughs> that is a real number. If anybody doesn't believe me, feel free to go on the NBA.com stats page to look it up yourselves. Um, is it sustainable? Absolutely not. They have a 140.8 offensive rating um, that is due to a 60, uh, actually slightly higher than a 65 effective field goal percentage. To put that into perspective, that's like eight points higher than the league leading Celtics effective uh, field goal percentage. So like the offensive numbers is going to come down, goes without saying. But the it's still like, even if they start shooting it worse, it's still very good. And the defense, I think, is absolutely real. There, it's a 105.2 defensive number. That's to me is legit. The point is, 
like we're lamenting the loss of OJ Ananobi. We're lamenting the loss of Julius Randall. The reason that those losses hurt so much is not because the, the Knicks can't field a competent starting five together. This starting five is fucking wrecking teams. It is because they are so thin. And the reason that they are so thin is because the guys that they traded for from Detroit can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And if either one of those two guys could do that, I think, as you just said, I think you'd be looking at uh, you would have won the week because I think they'd be 4-0. But they can't. And so here we are. And it, for the first time, really started to piss me off this weekend because they robbed Jalen Brunson of a win in a 60-point game. And they robbed the, the their all of their teammates. But like in particular, I thought Isaiah Hardenstein and Deuce of Pride played really special games against the Thunder. And like to say nothing of Josh Hart, who, you know, again, what do you get? 15 rebounds and however many. It's like these guys are giving it everything and the Detroit players are giving them nothing. And it's just. It's a shitty situation to be in. So that uh, who, who did I, I bogey, I guess, gets my detention. All right. There we go. Um. And now we are here. We've arrived. Yes. 10 and 10. We're tied. Um, we've each won 10, 10 times in the predictions. Um, I'm on a four-game winning streak, four-week winning streak. We'll see if I can bring it home. Here are the four games. Tuesday at Miami. Thursday, Sacramento at home. Friday. At Chicago, Sunday, at Milwaukee. For me, it's a different. It's between two and two and three and one. I don't think I'm surprising anybody by saying that. My there's a little bit of a push and pull between my head and my heart here. Um, looking ahead, feel good about the Sacramento game. And I feel good about the first Chicago game or the the, the, the only Chicago game this week because they played the Chicago 18 more times before the end of the year. So really, it's a matter of do I think they're going to go into Miami and beat the Heat? And to a lesser extent, if they go in and beat the Heat, is there a letdown game coming against? I guess it would probably be the Kings, although I don't think they're going to have a letdown game at home. And yeah, Um all right, I'm talking around in circles. I did not think about this once before I just started talking about it, and I figured I was just gonna because I've been go, I've been operating on the fly for a while now. I figure what what why change anything? Three and one, three and one. I really thought you were gonna go two and two. I have faith in this team. Okay, I was prepared to go three and one for whatever it's worth. Okay, but I will go two and two. I guess in this case, it's, you know, four games in six days with three of them on the road is a lot. But I was, I was going back and forth. I really, like, like I said, I was preparing for three and one or one and three with the leaning towards three and one. So, um, look, I, you know, I'm not going to say I hope you win, but I hope the Knicks win. Um, it, would not shock me at all if they lost to Miami. Um, for as I, I for as unimpressed as I have been with every time I watch the Heat play, it's the Heat. You know, it's the Heat. It's going to be a game in the last five minutes. You know, it's going to be a game in the last five minutes, and you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Also, back to back too. We should say, like going mm-hmm. to Chicago Thursday to Friday. That factors in. Um, but you know what? On, I said all that. You know what? The, why I think three and one. I feel again. They could go two and two. I go one and three. Who the hell knows? But why I feel okay about it? Who's to say they can't go into Milwaukee and beat Milwaukee next Sunday? Like you know, it's it's always a possibility. Okay, we'll see what happens. All right, um, that is it. There's nothing else on the spreadsheet, the page here. So, uh, Andrew, what what else? Anything we forgot? <laughs> Um, I figure I'll just say the announcement. I got to change my headline because maybe we did need Bruce Brown. Um, I uh, First of all, pregame pod's already out. Uh, the homie Giancarlo jumped on with me. He sings a much different tune about the Heat's 
chances at literally anything. So tune in to find out. I also hit him with a really good April Fool's joke at the top of the pod where I also gave him a bit of a third degree on why Jaime Hockeyus Jr. is responsible for most of my unhappiness. The Mets <laughs> covering the rest of my unhappiness for sure. Uh, and then watch alongs in post games all week. Of course, we've got uh, me, Mensa, and Sean uh, for the playback on Tuesday against the Miami Heat. Uh, and then uh, there's one last thing, John. Earl Clark was the former. Ah, uh, yes. Party. Yes. Earl Clark, the legendary Earl Clark. Um, had a cup of coffee with a few NBA teams, I believe. But uh, yeah, that shout out to him. I don't think I said two words to him that day, but you know, it was cool to be in his presence. Wouldn't That's know it. him if he was in front of me without a name tag. To I remember he was wearing basketball shorts. If he came up to me and said, hi, I'm Earl Clark. I'm like, okay. That's good. Who's that? It's like, yeah, okay. Great. I would have thought he was like British royalty. Earl Clark. You know, yeah. Like an oh, Earl. The Earl of Clark. Uh, okay. yeah. The Earl of Clark. Yeah. The I Earl see what Clark. you guys did there. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Jeremy, you have Vegas to go do. Andrew, you have some cheese to grate. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so inside and no one's going to know what that means. I have a fourth pod today to edit, John. That's what I have to do. <laughs> Shout out well, Mets Therapy. We all need it. Well, well yes, you do. Well, grating cheese. Um, and I am going to go, uh, I don't know, care for two children. This is great. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and um, yeah, tune in for all the stuff this week. It's the home stretch and we got you fully covered. So Please uh, tune into Nick's Film School for all of your uh, Nick's watching and listening needs. Uh, drop the review. Five stars, please. Uh, and uh, if you're watching on the YouTube, subscribe there too. And we will be back with more fun and games before you know it.